George Kilpatrick, inspiration for the nation, celebrating people we feel good about. Brad Butler II is in the house. Motivational speaker, author, pain, purpose. What's the other P? Pain, purpose, and what? Pain, passion, purpose. Pain, passion. So I got two of the Ps, right? Pain, passion, purpose. So glad to see Brad again. Brad is like my buddy in some ways because he always has a smile. He always has on black. And I want to know if that is like, so I don't have to think about what I have to wear black or because I like to look like this way black or because this is just what I do and I have to eliminate decisions about I'm gonna what I'm going to wear because I know it's going to be black. So so anyway, Brad, of course, is a motivator. Uh, he was recently in Syracuse, New York, where we originate this program from. And so I, 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 I had a chance to uh, watch Brad for the second time live. And I said, Brad, you got to come on and give a get our give our audience a little some some. And Brad's background is varied. Uh, he grew up in a family that was in to pharmaceuticals, and if I have to 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 explain that to you, then I ain't gonna because you should know what that means. <laughs> but he himself uh, had to navigate through some of that, but also he had to navigate through labels. Right? They said this is how he learns in school and so he had to navigate that special education and now look at him now look at him now right right master's degree speaking all over the country uh and he has his own business so uh brad is here to help us right for those of us who are in the midst of a transformation who need to be transformed but i i was actually watching his page the other day and there are some folk he can't help and we're going to talk about that. So let's start with, so his shirt, he's got a shirt on if y'all at home, y'all can't see it on the radio, but a shirt says next level living. So let's start with that, Brad, what's next level living and how do we get there? Uh, well, uh, you know, next level living, you know, shout out to, to my mentor, you know, Jeremy Anderson. Uh, because that's where it, it came from. That's where it stems from. Next level living. Uh, so you know, I just represent the brand because you know I love my big brother, and you know so I'm going to rep him to the fullest. And uh, so yeah, but next level living, man. That's just you know whatever it is that you do. There's always another level to attain. Like there's always more that you can do, more that you can accomplish. Uh, and the the limits that you have in front of you right now are only the limits because you haven't pushed them. And so let's talk about pushing them. What what holds us back from pushing to our limit, Brad? Ah, limited beliefs. You know, uh, you you first before you can you know break a glass ceiling, you have to believe that it can be broken. Like you, before you can attain a certain thing, you have to believe that it's attainable. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, you know, you would never attempt it. Like why sure. would you attempt something if you don't believe that you can actually do it? So before uh, anything is actually uh, you know executed on. There's a plan that they have in place, but first they have to actually believe that it's possible for them to put the plan together and execute on the plan for them to achieve said thing. So I, I, the first thing that popped in my head was like the Wright brothers. When you think about flight, you know, they were one day sitting around looking at birds flying. It was like, we can do that. Your mind got to go to a real weird place for you to say, I got enough confidence that I believe that I can fly like a bird and I'm a human and there's nothing on my body, nothing about me that says that I should be capable of doing so. But the mind works in mysterious ways, you know, and you're just like, if I believe it, you know, I I'll find a way to get it done. So. All right. So what did you have to change in your thinking to take yourself to the next level? Oh, man, I had to stop, you know, believing the things that I was told you know, the limited beliefs that people were placing on me, not even the be limited beliefs that I placed on myself. That's the thing. Some people, they don't, they're not, uh, you know, achieving all that they could out of this life because not because of what they say to themselves is because of what they believe that other people have said to them. That's mm -hmm. the crazy part. Somebody tell you you're dumb, but you get A's like, and you actually sit there and believe it. Oh, you're not smart or you're not this, you're not that, you know, you're not, you know, you're not going to amount to anything. And before you even have the opportunity to go out there and try to achieve something or try to amount to something, you are auto automatically are in the negative because you're like, I'm not even going to try. So yes, of course, you're not going to amount to anything. You're not trying. So uh, little stuff like that, that can, you know, hinder you getting your way, little roadblocks. So you got to, you know, you got to detox yourself of certain things and certain people. And you got to make sure that you're 
fo more focused on what you say to yourself and making sure that what you say to yourself is something positive because the majority of the thoughts that flow through our head in a day, 85% of them are actually negative if you don't get control over it. You know, this idea of detoxing from certain people, certain places, certain things. The detoxing from people is often the hardest thing to do. Oh, yeah. Uh, the detox, because when you detox, it causes withdrawal. And the withdrawal makes you want to go back to that thing. Like you want that dopamine hit again. So whatever it is, oh, I got to go to the club. Oh, I got to be with these women. Oh, I got to be out here, you know, drinking. Oh, I got to be smoking. Or I got to do whatever it is. You're just trying to get back to that dopamine hit. What I've learned is that, and I, I guess I get this from, you know, my, the thought process from my father, because my father uh, and my mother, they were both heroin addicts uh, for years, but they were able to beat their addiction. My mom went to uh, the meetings and, you know, with counselors and things like that to do it that way and walk through like the step-by-step -step process. My father locked himself in my aunt's attic and he went cold turkey and like sweated it out of his system because he legitimately believed that he could beat it. Like mm -hmm. he didn't want anything to have control over him like that. So when I learned about that story, something clicked in my mind. It was just like, Brad, if that isn't your father, that's inside of you too. Mm -hmm. So any form of adversity, any form of a stronghold that's on you, Brad, you have the ability to break it. Like you might not break it that first day or that first week or first month. It might even take you a couple of years, but you can break it. Like you'll get better, you know, day by day. And there have been little things within my life that I've used that mentality on to break any form, anything that I thought could potentially be a stronghold on my life. I've used that method. And I'm like, nope, cold turkey. We're going to break this thing. Um, did you, so do you like drink or smoke uh, or did you, uh, or, or do you do it in moderation or do you like shun it all together? Uh, I've never done drugs. I've never smoked. Uh, drinking, I did. I did used to drink when I was uh, younger, when I was in college and things like that. And then when I got out of college, I still drank socially. Mm -hmm. um, and then I realized one day, I was like, why am I drinking? Like, I was like, I don't even, like, <laughs> something that I really even, like, but like when I was in high school, they call it like, you call me, people call me B-Rad. But in high school, because I didn't drink or smoke or do drugs, people used to call me B-Regular. Because mm -hmm. I was just, they was like, yo, he just high on, li on life. He don't need nothing. He just good the way he is. He regular. He good. Mm -hmm. So. I didn't, I realized I didn't start drinking until like I had my, like my first heartbreak, right? After that happened and I just, I would drink because it was like, oh, if I take a couple of drinks, it's easier for me to go to sleep. I, was like, I wouldn't even drink till I was like dead drunk. I was just drinking. It was like, oh, okay, I'm more comfortable. I can just go to sleep now. And then that came, you know, became a thing that helped me. And then once I got over the heart, heartbreak, then I was just drinking casually because then I I was drink. I, I had gotten used to drinking. So it was just what it was, what it was. So when I got older and I was like, oh, wow. I don't think I really want to drink anymore. There's no real need for it. Right. And then, right. you know, I just broke myself away from it. Right. So when you talk about, uh, and you was talking about detoxing in order for that transformation to occur, a lot of us find ourselves at crossroads, right? And it's, you know, you've got to make some choices. And I see that this detoxification of relationships, uh, we talked about people. There's also place, Right. Because even yourself, you would you move from a certain environment to a more suburban environment, and that certainly influenced uh, the choices that you make. And you find a lot of people who may be uh, in one lifestyle, they move to maybe upstate from downstate New York or whatever to to experience a different lifestyle away from the people, but also the space. Right? I remember my boy when he. He was, you know, in a program, right? And the purpose of the program was to really get you out of the choice that you make. It could be addiction, could be whatever it is, right? But then he found, well, I'm going to just go around the way for a minute. And you know what happened, right? Recidivism, right? He went right back and because he thought he was stronger than the thing in that neighborhood. And it turned out that it wasn't. And I'm not saying that you can't rehab and, and be strong in the neighborhood that you live in. I'm not saying that at all, but your chances of success improve if those influences may be too much for you. Speak to that because I'm not saying that you can't do it in place, but sometimes you have to move your place to be successful. Uh, yeah, when it comes to like those type of strongholds and addictions and uh, things like that, 
I read a book um, by uh, James Clear uh, called Atomic Habits. Uh, and in that, one of the biggest things that I took away from me said uh, the best way to beat an addiction or like a stronghold is to avoid it, not to um, resist it. It, it. You have to avoid it, not resist it. So if you know that you're a drinker, then you, you can't go into the bar. You have to drive past it. Mm. Like, otherwise, you'll you'll put yourself in a situation where now you're fighting against yourself on whether you should you know do this or not do it. Um, also, the way I look at things is I look at it as hot or cold, mm -hmm. right or wrong. There is no gray area. area. There is no in the middle. It's mm -hmm. either we're doing this or we're not. Mm -hmm. it's like that, that's all there is to it. So with me going like me taking the leap of faith to, to be a full time speaker, once I made the decision that I was in, that was it. I, I can't go backwards now. Walk through that decision because mm -hmm. some of us need to jump into something else. And mm -hmm. there's a whole lot to consider before you do that, right? And you want to win and you want to succeed. And 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 it's in some ways it sounds like you have to take a bet on yourself. But what mm -hmm. was your mindset like? Because we want to bless somebody right now. How can we bless somebody who is in mm -hmm. that place? Mm -hmm. So for me, I'd already spent years working on my craft. Mm -hmm. So I knew how to do the work. I knew if you gave me a microphone and put me on stage, I could deliver. Mm -hmm. So that's where some people go wrong. You haven't mastered your craft yet, but yet you want to run out there and, you know, and go gung ho into this thing. But you haven't mastered your craft. You haven't done enough where you have enough experience for you to be able to say, hey, I, I can do this. Like I specialize in this area. You're, you just want to do it. You just like the thought of doing it, like the idea of doing it. But a lot of times you don't know what all is um, encompassed in, in actually being immersed in it and like being an entrepreneur or whatever the case may be. So for me, I just been working on myself for years to be ready for the opportunity. And I put myself in a situation where, uh, I wasn't necessarily looking to go full time as a speaker. I was still trying to do more like to like, OK, let me get this in order. Let me figure this out and figure that out and do this. And, and I honestly, and, you know, I'm a faith driven person. So like God was just like, OK, enough. <laughs> like, you're you're mm. not going to lead. So I'm going to force you out. I know you like you're an extremist. So once you have your mind dead set and locked in on something, you're like, nope, I'm going I'm to stay here and I'm going to figure this out and I'm going to make this work and I'm going to do X, Y, and Z and I'm going to get this in order. Da, da, da. So the time was never going to come for me because I was always going to be working on something else, something else, something else. So he was like, OK, I got to kick you out. So I had to leave the job that I was at because it was during um, COVID, during COVID. And I was working at a group home and all of the uh, the 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 residents who are at the uh, the group home, they all ended up getting COVID. I was the only one who didn't. Mm hmm. I was the only one who didn't get COVID. So they're like, well, you still have to work hands on with them and stuff. I'm like, I can't work hands on with them. I'm going to get COVID. They're like, well, you have to do it. I was like, okay, well, that's not going to work. So, you know, I had a conversation, you know, with my wife, had a conversation with my mom, had a conversation with Jeremy Anderson. I called him. And the funny thing about it is- Jeremy Anderson I is your mentor, right? He's your mentor. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, so I- um. I talked to him about it and everything. And, and really what it was is I knew what I was supposed to do. I knew I was supposed to just pack it up and leave. But I was calling just, I guess, was like, hey, I, if just one person says, oh, no, 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 you should probably wait. Then I probably would be like, OK, I'll just stick it out and probably would end up, you know, in there getting COVID and all that and whatever. But everyone said, no, it's time to leave. Mm -hmm. Everyone said, no, you know how to speak. You know how to do this. You're getting paid as a speaker already. Like, so just go do it full time. Like you're putting 40 hours or more into this job, right? Imagine if you put 40 hours or more into your calling, into your mm. purpose. Come on. Just imagine, like, just think about it, George. It was like, I was booking speaking engagements. I was already getting paid. So I'm getting three, four, five paid speaking engagements a month as I'm working, you know, this job doing 40 or more hours a week doing that. It's like, well, what if I put all my time and all my effort into it? Uh, if I had, okay, I got my website together, got my demo reel, got my EPK, I got my my testimonials, I got my skill set, I got what's, my mentors, I got what's EPK? Uh, electrical press kit. Oh, thank you. Okay, <laughs> right, no problem. 
So I got my mentors. So I got I got Eric Thomas. I got Jeremy Anderson. I got Inky Johnson. I got Chris Crumpler. Like I got all my mentors who on my side. They were like, you can call me anytime you need me if I if there's something going wrong. No problem. And sure enough, I used my resources, got myself together, and I took off. Went out there and just got and got to work. So what did the pain? That was it. I had no safety net. So so your book is pain, passion, purpose, and I'm sure in all in that decision. There's always pain in the beginning. How did you, how did you move through that, and the the second guessing of this decision that you made? Because you said it was smooth sailing, but I'm sure that first day must have been like, damn, did what did what did I really just decide to do this? Like when you're like no safety net, um, what did you? How did you move through that? All right, so. I, my skill set was there. I knew what to do. I knew if you got me on stage, I was I I was good. I had it. The thing was getting on stage consistently now. So mm. the first three months was all over the place. It was crazy. It was a couple of times where I was like, okay, I was telling my wife, I might have to go back to work because I don't I don't know what I'm doing. Like I, I don't have this really structured properly. And she was like, all right, well, then get some structure. Like ask your mentors what you should be doing. And then I did that, started putting that to work and got some structure, structure, structure together. And that's what led me to where I'm at now. Cause it's like, okay, now I know what I'm doing now. I know when to do it now. Okay. I got all this stuff in place, but that first three months, it was crazy. It was all over the place. I was going just bleeding through my savings. And, you know, I like that you said that because in, you do have to um, walk through some of that, right. To get to the other side and you could easily give up. What kept you focused? What kept you on the path? Uh, because other people are making these choices and they're like, did I make the right choice? Did I make the right decision? Uh, for me, uh, you know, all right, Kobe Bryant said it best. He said, there's too many people out here. They listen to people when they say, oh, don't put all your eggs in one basket. He said, no, nah, put all your eggs in one basket. And then when the, you, the second you get an opportunity, you put some more eggs in that basket. For mm -hmm. me, I only have a plan A. That's it. That's all I got. Mm -hmm. I'm not looking for a plan B. I'm not looking for an escape route. So like, I told my wife from the beginning, when, when I first got started, she said, okay, Brad, for, take six months to work on this, you know, using your savings and everything. And if you can start to generate money and all that, then we're cool. We'll give you, then you go another six months and we keep going and see if we can make it work. I said, no, that's not going to work. Give me three months. Give me three mm -hmm. months to turn a profit. And I right. put the pressure on myself. I put the fire under myself. And then three months, I, I made some money. And I said, give me uh, give me another three months. And she said, okay, you got another three months. And we never had that conversation again. How about that? And at the end of the day, it's the six months she said anyway, but it worked out, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so uh, I had to ask you earlier, we're talking about Brad Butler, author, motivational speaker, book, Pain, Passion, Purpose. So now we're at the passion part of it. So tell me about the all black and why you do that. Uh, so... Uh, the all black is actually called the monotonous wardrobe. And I got it from uh, Mark Zuckerberg and Steve Jobs. So it's just like what I wear. I really want that to be the last thing I have to think about. Yeah. So there yeah. is a conscious thing you're doing. Yes. It's, right. It is. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. And then, of course, you know, I'm an African-American. I'm black. Listen, so I'm pr I'm prideful when it comes to, you know, who I am, where I come from, all black. So it's all good to me. But it's it's not like I'm trying to, you know, bring back the uh, the Black Panthers or, you know, I'm trying no. to be a part of Black Panther Party or anything like that. And I have nothing against them. It's just like that's not what it stands for. So because I, I mean, you look at can you look the same everywhere we see you? And that's because but I want to talk about that because you basically said this is my uniform. Yes. And this is and I because and I noticed that some people who are very highly successful, this is the last thing they want to think about. I, I look at like the owner of the Yankees. I could tell you he had a blue jacket, a white turtleneck and gray pants or Steve Jobs, whatever his whatever he had on. Or, right. The same thing. And um, and that's I, I, I that's I, I figured that's what you were doing. And I wanted you to name that because there's, you know, a lot of us want to have this and that to match this and that and the other. That's not your game. I ain't got time for it. I, I got to get to my purpose. My purpose is to get on that stage and deliver a message. So whether I'm in a black tee, a black hoodie, or some uh, black jeans, black sneakers, it doesn't matter. It's, it's going to be all black. Like mm -hmm. if I showed you my closet right now, it's nothing but black and white clothing. That's it. 
and 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 that's intentional, right? It's and intentional. I, it's very intentional. So, and it's also branding, right? I mean, you're also branding. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. It took me some time to get used to in the summertime, though. <laughs> right, right, right. So, so Brad, you know, passion, per pain, passion, purpose. You, as as someone who's overcome the the, you talked about. I I, I teased at the beginning of the the show, you know, labeled special ed. And now look at you, right? And so you had to navigate through that too. Talk about that because there's a lot of young men uh, in particular. Uh, I like to focus on young men. I know we want to focus on girls. So there's a lot of young people mm -hmm. who are labeled, right? And parents resist that label, right? I don't want my kid, my kid ain't, you know, a lot of times we resist it. And I don't know, I don't know if you ever had to, to have medication or anything or whatever, but, um, I and HIPAA, I understand that, but I'm just saying, I don't know if you've ever had to deal with it that way. But talk to me about what that meant for you and what you thought you were capable of. And then when did you learn I'm capable of much more than this label suggests? And it's not to say that people who are labeled of special ed aren't brilliant people, I'm not saying that at all. But when for parents and children, it says something to them that in some ways makes them feel like they can't do something. So just wanted to just contextualize that. This is not to say that somebody who has uh, been labeled mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and having needing extra attention, because my thing is we all learn differently. Right? right. And that's how we should be framing it. I need a little bit more of this for me to understand it better. Right. So that kind of thing. Yeah. So, so for me, I did not need any form of a med medication at all. Uh, like my mom allowed them to place me in special ed classes and uh, it stemmed from me coming from Jersey city and then going to East Windsor, New Jersey. So if you know of East Windsor, New Jersey, their, their uh, educational system is pretty good. Like they have a really, a pretty good uh, educational system over there. So I was not up to speed for them, for their liking. And instead of trying to help me to kind of catch up, to other students, they said it'd be easier to put me in special ed classes. So even if you looked at like my IEPs and everything like that, it there's no labels of like a mental uh, disability or like a specific learning disability. It's just Brad struggles with math or reading or comprehension or writing. It just, I wasn't up to par because how do you catch up to something if you know you're kind of holding me back in this in a sense you, you see what i'm saying mm -hmm. uh so that's all it was and then it just being in those classes and just like okay it, it kind of is what it is you you just you kind of sit there and like oh i guess this is who i am i guess this is what it is i guess these certain things aren't for me like maybe college is for other people but it's not for me right. um the worst thing that happened that could have happened is, is that somebody instilled a piece of hope in me and right. it wasn't even a lot it was just a piece i'm just an extremist so it's like if you give me a oh listen you give me a little bit of rope i'll turn into a cowboy on you like it's just one of them things where it's like don't give me a little, little bit of something to work with because yeah, i'll turn it into something right and that's the end of what happened is some two teachers lauren gleason felicia alexander two caucasian teachers who saw me and was like hey man he, he really is, is actually trying to do something with himself like uh, most other kids don't care he cares he cares if he doesn't get a certain grade he cares if he misses an assignment or gets something wrong like he cares so that means something so let's work with him and see what we can do and sure enough they didn't realize that they sparked something and turned me into what i am today or what helped me <laughs> right help you to find your purpose and now he so, and now here you are you speak to young people all over this country and we, I was talking to an educator today and she was saying to me, achievement. What can we say to young people about achievement and parents? Be, uh, she was also saying that, you know, parents are showing up to the school, you know, smoking, of smelling of weed, if you will. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, and so that's parents, but also youth being infected and influenced by that. So what are you hearing from youth? What are you saying to youth? How can we re, um, mo re mo reignite the minds of our students so that they uh, understand the power that they have? And how do we help parents and community members navigate this particular time? Because I feel like we're in, 
you know, we're in a particular time in this country. I know of of young people who do well academically, but then they find themselves running with a crowd who's into criminal activity, right? Mm -hmm. And so what are they what aren't they getting? And what's the alarm that parents need to have to communicate to their youth from what you're seeing out here dropping into these cities all across the country? Well, um, anything that a child is not getting at home, they're going to go get it in the streets. They're going to go get it someplace else. So, for example, if, um, uh, okay, so if, if a, there's a, a young man and his the father's not at home, right? There's but so much that the mother can do. So if he needs that that masculine love, like, that that like yo bro that like come on man i got you like we're going this is how you do that, that, that like this is what a man does like, if he's not getting that at home he's going to go searching for it and if he finds it in the streets and the first thing you'd be like okay oh he got a he got the car he got the clothes he got the chain he got the money he got the girls oh that must be what a man is because everybody is surrounding him and he's popular that must be okay so i'm gonna go over there so if he's a drug dealer if he happens to be in a gang or whatever he might be he'll gravitate to that person and guess what he's gonna do whatever he did to get what he has even if he doesn't necessarily agree with it he's like yo but that's what a man does and i want to be treated as a man i want to be the man so i'm going to do x y and z you know, so it's same thing with women. If they're not getting the love and support that they feel like they should be getting at home, they'll go get it in the streets. So they'll try to go get it from another man, whether it's, you know, physically, emotionally, with financially, whatever it is, they're going to do whatever they need to do to get whatever it is that they're missing. So if you're like, OK, my, my child is running rampant, dude, it's time to have a conversation and there needs to be some effective communication like and you should address it. I'm just saying I, I, I believe it would help. Uh, I don't have I'm not I don't have all the answers uh, for the parents. But what I can say is it can start with a simple conversation of openness and just saying, yeah, how am I doing as a parent? What are you missing from me? What can I provide for you? What do you need from me? And you'd be surprised. It might open Pandora's box and it just start flooding information like, well, I wish you could do this more. I wish you were around more. I wish we spent more time. I wish you came to more of my games. There's a, like my father never asked you know, any type of questions like that, how I was really feeling or doing or how I really was. He never really could decipher and really wasn't really in tune yeah. like that. So like my father, he didn't, I don't remember my father saying he loved me until, but my senior year in high school. And that's because he thought he was going to die. So, so that was that. But there were issues that I had with my dad because I felt like there was a disconnect because there was like no emotion between us. Mm -hmm. And then with my mom is like, there was a disconnect because you're just not physically there. Mm. You know what I'm saying? So like, with each uh each child and each parent whatever it could be a different thing you just never know unless you start you know peeling back the onions and you start asking questions you know thought provoking questions where it's like okay how do you feel about my parenting all right what could i be doing better like i'm talking about you got to be asking these questions as if you were at a job right as if you were at a job trying to get a raise like what could i be doing better okay what am i lacking what do i need to do like i'm always kind of thinking about that cuz i'm a father now and I have a child and I'm always thinking, OK, I need my son to be able to be open with me and know that he can tell me if yo, dad, you you missed the mark with this. I'm like, ah, I, I, I didn't come to your game. I'm sorry. I didn't. Oh, man. Yeah. That, okay. and, and, and you know what's interesting about that, Brad, because for many of us raised in a certain way and raised in a certain generation, we will ne we we can't bring ourselves to ask that question because we grew up when do as I say, not as I do as I say, not as I do, whatever it is, like go sit mm -hmm. down, children are to be seen and not heard, that kind of thing. And we're not in that time now, right? Mm -hmm. And for a lot of us, it's hard to understand that, right? Because we grew up a certain way and 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 you're asking us to give up everything we know. To communicate with us. Because what child. has it gotten you thus far? Okay. Because what because what has it gotten you thus far? Okay. Okay. What's and the alternative? So, mm -hmm. It's like you keep doing what you've been doing, then you keep getting what you've already got. Now you want change, you want something different. It's the same as like when people look at me and be like, Oh, he doesn't wear a suit, so he can't come speak. I don't want him to come speak here. He doesn't wear a suit. Have okay? they said that to you? I've had people say it before. Yeah, yeah. I've had people like be like, Oh, well, you, you know, you would do a lot better if you put on a suit. Says who? Says who? Like, I do just fine when I get on that stage. Put the mic in my hand. You'll see. <laughs> my, 
you know what I'm saying? But if you want something different, if you want change, you got to do something that's different. If you want radical change, you have to do something that's radically different. So mm. like that you've had the people with the three piece suits get on your stage and, right. and lie to the kids. Oh. And, then they turn around and, do, <laughs> and then they turn around and find out they don't have integrity. You find out they out here doing dirt and this, that, and the other. There ain't no smut on my name. That's mm. not me, but you like you can't, but but don't try to ding me because I choose to dress a different way. Listen, I'm comfortable when I'm on stage, I'm giving it up. I'm sweating. I'm not trying to be doing that in a three-piece suit. Mm -hmm. And it's and it works for you. And I think it's getting comfortable. You said in a recent um video, um uh clip that you posted on IG that there's somebody that, so you consider yourself a motivational speaker who can help everybody, but there's a group of people you said. You cannot help. Talk to me. <laughs> um, I, I, I can only help those who want to help themselves. That that's that's a fact. But um, and and I know what clip you're talking about. I said, uh, if you know what you want to do but you don't know how to do it, we can help you with that. Right. But if you don't know what you want to do with your life, we we there's nothing I can do and there's nothing that anybody else can do for you because you have no idea what you want to do with your life. You have like you have no idea. You haven't even taken the time to research and you know do the analysis on yourself and say what are my gifts? What are so, my talents? So going back to this idea then of young people, what are they telling you that they're not getting from us? Um, you know what. I don't even know that they are even saying all too much because this new generation is rebellious. They're doing mm. it. They're doing it. Whatever it is that they want to do, whatever it is right. that they want to say, they're saying it and they're doing it. Like you see some of these new, the new generation where you're like, whoa, I can't believe he said or she said that to, to that adult or whatever, because they feel like they're not being respected anyway. So even so they feel like even if I was being respectful to you, you're 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 demeaning me. So you think just because I'm you're an elder, you get to talk to me any kind of way. And, and now am I saying they should be going the way going uh going about things the way that they're doing it? No. But what I am saying, what I am noticing is they are getting results. And if they then some of them are like, uh, by any means necessary. So some of them will knock your head clean right off your shoulders because of the fact that you are not listening to me and you keep disrespecting me. So guess what? Pow, here it comes. Yeah, and, and, now, and, and now it's like, you ain't got to worry about this no more. And that's problematic for me because we. it seems to me that there are some that mm -hmm. we haven't, well, disrespectful. I, that, I can't deal with that. Like there's, we should, and we, we, this is why there's a conflict in some ways with some parts of our generation, because here's what, here's, here's a stereotype. In other words, these young people, they don't listen and they're causing a ruckus and, you know, we try to tell them to do the right thing and they don't want to listen. And they're not, I, I, I think for, for some, it's just not being respectful this this idea of talking back or talking back to your parents we would never think of doing anything like that what the heck is going on brad well it's not that it wasn't necessarily going on or it wasn't happening there those things were happening maybe not at the the scale that we're right. seeing, seeing it now but now that we have social media oh it's all over the place so anytime anybody does anything it's out there for everyone to see so another thing is when you're going to the youth, when people are out there going to the youth saying, you should do something different. You shouldn't be selling drugs or you shouldn't be scamming or you shouldn't be in the streets <laughs> or you shouldn't be in a gang. Right. You're actually doing more damage than good when you say that to them if you don't have another alternative. Mm. If you don't have something else to give them in the moment, don't say nothing to them. Leave them alone because you can't fix the problem that they're dealing with. So you're making it worse. So, so that you're making them so battle within themselves. What you're saying to me is don't come to me with no okie doke unless you got an answer for me right here and right now. You need to come with something. Like there, you need to come with something, like a, a solution to the problem. Like you can't just come up there. Like you see people sometimes stop selling. You can't be selling drugs on my block. You better get out of here and this, that, and other. Okay, so you're reprimanding them, but really instead of reprimanding them just go up to them and say yo man i see y'all i see y'all on the corner every week that's what's okay y'all y'all got this business booming yo y'all ever thought about doing something like like legal 
Like you ever thought about like taking the same mindset and maybe like selling shoes or like reselling shoes? It's like that, that, that stock X thing that they got going on. You ever thought about getting to the stock market or anything like that? Like, nah, All right, I just wanted to let y'all know that that was a possibility. Like I'm not pushing it on them. I'm just, I'm just letting y'all know it's an option out there. When they see me, they see, they see themselves in me because they're like, oh, okay, he got the fitted on, he got the t-shirt and the and the J's on, and, and he a, he an entrepreneur, he he worked for himself. Oh, hold on, wait, oh. let me at least listen. So the J's is part of the uniform. Uh, kinda, yeah, kinda. <laughs> is. kinda is. The funny thing is, I like the, I actually like the dunks though. The dunks actually are my my real shoes that I really like to wear. They're the most comfortable for me. All right, yeah, I, I do wear the Jordans. Yeah, I just wanted to add, you know, I. I my my kids, they got me a pair. And it's so funny because I went to some place with young people and I wanted to do, I wanted to show, you know, that I got a little game with them. So I put the Jordans on, uh, but I'm not a shoe person like that. Like I don't have like a million pair of Jordans. In fact, since, you know, I'm a Nick fan, I was like later for that. But anyway, so, so, so Brad, let's help some people, right? Because, somebody's at a crossroads like you are somebody needs some practical what i'm gonna do right now to get to the next level of whatever it is that i want to do whether i want to get out of a relationship stop a bad habit break an addiction um because you know i always find it i always i'm always amazed that people can talk about their uh pathology if you will and 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 be okay with that and i don't know when when you got comfortable doing that but I'm always admiring of people who are able to do that. Oh, well, th thank you. I, I kind of always been somewhat of an open book, except for the whole special ed thing that I kept to myself for a very, very long time until I became a speaker. And it was like, Brad, you have to tell them, like, mm -hmm. you got to tell them that in order for this to make sense. So there's that, but. For so you did go to speaker training. Just let's be clear about that. Right. You, you were trained. Yeah, I was trained. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You didn't yeah. just jump out here with a story. And Dude. so your speaker said, that's a piece of your story that you got to tell is what you, what you're saying. Yeah, absolutely. It was something I was ashamed of. You know, mm -hmm. when you, when you go to, you're in special ed classes, it's almost like you're a meet, you're, you're, you're immersed in shame because you're separate mm. from everybody else. Mm -hmm. You know, you're, you're not meeting the, the standard. So that was the thing that I just didn't want to talk about, but my, you know, but I, by that time I'd already gotten my bachelor's degree. Like I'd already overcome, I'd already done these things, but sometimes you revert back to that little boy or that little girl who's hurt because you never addressed the issues. You never, you know, started the healing process. Me getting my master's degree in counseling was a part of the healing process. Mm. It, was, it was me constantly going back to class and talking about what my experiences were and how I felt and, you know, this, that, and the other, and like me constantly dealing with it. So I got to the point where I was like, this no longer has a stronghold over me. You want to talk about it? Let's talk about it. Mm. And as a counselor, you, you're able to help others with that. So let's give them some, let's, let's give some tools, mm -hmm. Brad, let's give them some tools. Okay. So if you are looking to whatever it is that you want to do, right? It doesn't matter if you want to be an entrepreneur or you're pursuing uh, degrees or, or a job, whatever, a career path, whatever it is. The first thing you need to do is you need to have a plan. Like you need to actually like everybody's like, oh, I got a plan in my head. No, write it down, make it plain. I can't explain it to you. And some of y'all believe me, some of you won't, but I can't explain to you what happens when you actually sit down and put your, like put pen to paper and write that thing down and actually look at it and then you have and then you have to remind yourself you know maybe a couple of weeks or something like that later and you come back and you look at it again it's like i did say i was going to do this i did say i was going to make this change i did say i was going to do something different and i didn't do it oh hold on i got to get on this mm -hmm. because now you like you breaking a promise to yourself something happens like the universe kind of gets out of your way it opens doors for you when you actually put your your stamp of approval on something when you stake your claim on something when you say out of your mouth you're going to make a certain thing happen like life and death is in the power of the tongue and i believe that why i'm an orator everything that i say i believe i can make come to fruition if i tell you today that i'm going to be an astronaut and that's what i really wholeheartedly believe i'm going to do you can't tell me that i can't do it unless i'm six feet under the ground mm-hmm so that's how I look at things. So write down your plan, 
make it plain and get detailed with it. Then after that, start taking the action steps. Okay, what is it going to take for me to be able to do this thing? Start with the end in mind and start reverse engineering your success. Okay, I said, if I'm going to be one of the best motivational speakers in the world, if I'm going to be traveling around the country, being an international speaker, all those things, I need to get around those who are already doing it. And I have to be able to be willing to invest in myself, invest in my time and be willing to fail. That's that's the problem. I tell people in the Speakers Academy that I'm a part of with Jeremy and E.T. and Inky and all of them who like, yo, Brad, man, you're doing well, man. You're doing great. This, that, and other. I'm like, stop. Stop. The only reason that you're coming to me and you're giving me this quote unquote praise, me being a great speaker, I'm doing very well and, and the money's good and all that. The only reason you're saying that to me and somebody else might not be saying that to you right now is because I have been willing to fail more times than you have. Mm. I love it. I love it. I'm just willing to fail because I know on the road to failing, success is right around the corner. So I was willing to look busted and disgusted, battered and bruised. Like, oh man, he sucks. He's not a good speaker. Oh, he, that's ain't, that wasn't good. That wasn't a good transition. That he wouldn't stay on point. That wasn't on topic. That he spoke for too long. He spoke too short. That wasn't it. Oh man, look at his brand. It's all off. Look the way he dressed. Da, da, da. Like I went through it so that I could learn in the process and just get the nicks and bruises that come along with it. And now I'm at the point where it's like, no, nope, I know exactly what to do. I know what works. I know what doesn't work. I know myself better than anybody else. I'm not trying to be other speakers and do what they do. I am a keynote motivational speaker. I kick off or I close the event for you. That is what I do, right? Now, can I do workshops? Absolutely, right? I can do those. Can I provide you with a curriculum? Absolutely. I can do that too. But the bread and butter, the thing I know I do hands down, the thing I put the most time and effort into is my keynotes. So I know what my thing is. I know what my niche is. I'm good money there. The problem with you is you don't know what you want to do and you're not actually putting the time in. So write down your plan, make it plain, put the time in so you can master your craft. And then here's the cheat code. Here's the one that it's, I don't know why people don't do it. You, it's a cheat code. It's, cheat, it's code. A cheat code. This is it. Get a mentor. Like I, I, I said it with the second one a little bit, but like you really have got to, don't just pay for mentorship, right? You have actually got to be immersed in it. You have got to get on their nerves. Like I used to get on my mentor's nerves. Like, hey man, I got a question about this. Hey man, I got the, I'm on every call. I'm asking every question. I'm taking all the notes. I got notebooks full of notes just because I need to know. Okay, I got to be ready. I got to be ready for the moment. I got to be ready for this, that, and the other. Like, I remember going with Jeremy. He took me with him when he did a, um, uh, um, a professional development. Jeremy uh, Anderson. Engagement. Jeremy yeah. Anderson, yep. He took me with him when he went to a, a professional development uh, situation. I'd never done a professional development keynote before, ever. Never done one. But I went with him, and right after, he quizzed me. He said, okay, what did I do? What did I say? What was my transition? What were the key points for this, that, and the other? How long did I speak? This, that, and the other, blah, blah, blah. And he's like, what did I do right? What could I have done differently? And I gave him all, I ran ran it all down for him. He said, okay, great, great notes. You got it. If you do exactly what I did, you, you'll be ready to do a, a, a professional development. Sure enough, a couple of weeks later, I started pitching that thing, and I got one, went out, knocked it out the park. Why? Because I knew what to do, and I stayed on my mentor's hip. Mm. That's the cheat code. All right. And we just heard some pain. We heard some purpose. And we definitely heard some passion. Brad Butler, the second. Um, we love you, Brad. Talk to me about how people find you. Uh, man, I'm on all social media platforms. If you can't find me, you just ain't trying. It's Brad Butler. Holla. Brad <laughs> Butler. Brad Butler, too. Brad Number Butler the second on yeah. everything. So if you search, you know, on Google, Brad Butler the second, there you go. It's right there. If you look into, you know, find me to book me or that type of thing, Brad Butler, uh, the number two dot com, www.bradbutler, the number two dot com. Very easy to find. I see you got the two books behind you, Pain, Passion, and Purpose. What's the other book? Oh, no, this is just like uh my um like social media and all that stuff over there. Oh, oh. and oh, this other book, this is the Bible. Oh, I got you. <laughs> He's like, a man. I know y'all know that one. A, a man of faith. All right, Brad Butler the uh, second. Always a pleasure to have this brother stop by and give us some love and some wisdom. And um, we wish you the sex. So now, did y'all take notes? Do y'all remember what he said you have to do? What did he say? Y'all hit me up here and let me know what he said. And then not only what he said, 
what you're going to do. All right? Inspiration for the nation. Let's go.